Yeah, give give them a couple minutes to join. Exactly. Hello, everyone. Wherever you are, we're just letting the attendees in. So it's going to be recorded at the same time. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel session called uh, Strategies in the Digital Pandemized Age. I'm Nadine Bruder, the co-chair of this panel and currently based out of Germany. I'm the founder of Just Am Right, a platform for sustainability-focused venture building and investments, which is backed by an international network of entrepreneurs, domain experts, creatives, scientists, and also investors. And last year, we launched India's first sustainability startup venture program that is led by women only. And uh, my professional background, uh, just briefly, I have 15 years of experience in business strategy, digital te technology, um, fintech, lifestyle, and ESG invest innovations. And today I have the privilege to welcome three esteemed industry experts who I love to introduce you now. Sam Seeley. Sam, just hey. <laughs> raise your hands. <laughs> Sam Seeley is, is the lead digital asset advisor for the Digital Economist, uh, in short, D TDT, um, a global impact organization with the mission to drive techno technological convergence towards a human-centered digital economy, along with the world's most respective digital economists in 2019. TDE co-authored Blockchain economy, Economics, Implication of Distributed Ledgers, Markets, Communications, Networks, and Algorithmic Realities the first book on the economics of blockchain. The organization also co-authored the foundational paper on tokenomics, defining how value is created in tokenized assets. And Sam has over 10 years of experience in the digital asset space, focusing on sustainable protocols and projects designed to help advance financial inclusion and expand economic opportunities. Welcome, Sam. <laughs> then we have... New Goldstein, exactly. <laughs> New Goldstein is the CTO and co-founder of Celsius Network, um, which is a decentralized cryptocurrency lending company. One can call it also a cryptocurrency bank. And um, Celsius Network serves a community of over 1 million users already that can deposit a range of different cryptocurrencies, um, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. And they can earn interest, but also borrow cash by replacing uh, by placing their cryptocurrencies as securities. Mr. Goldstein's career ranges from image processing to AI to IoT and blockchain. Prior to his work on Celsius, he designed P2P credit protocols using distributed storage and smart contracts. And also worth mentioning, I feel, is his co-founder, um, Alex Manchinsky, who was also known for inventing the voice over internet protocol, so the, vo the VoIP, <laughs> so to speak. And then we have Pankaj Gupta. He, <laughs> he is the co-founder and director of Gulf Islamic Investments, in short, GII. And he is also spearheading the investments firm's innovation and entrepreneurship program, which is co-created and also in partnership with the Indian Institute of Technology. Gulf Islamic Investments is a full-service Sharia-compliant global investment company with offices in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and with 3 billion US dollars under management. Its focus is on growth partnerships, technology and real estate investments. In 2021, GII set up its second fund dedicated to the Indian and to the Southeast Asian market. And GII also incubates business ideas um, themselves and also has an impact arm that invests in education and health-related initiatives. Welcome, everyone. It's truly a pleasure. And let me also um, please mention that Carlos Moreira, who was um, announced for this panel, um, 
He can't make it. Carlos Moreira is founder and CEO of the global cybersecurity and blockchain technology um, company called Wisekey. And as they launched the, the first secure NFT in space, <laughs> or from space, from space and with Brooke Shields photography, he's unfortunately not available today to attend this panel. So let's get started. Our panel is all about the question, how will not fully digitized firms change their structures and also their strategies to, to compete for virtual personnel, financial services and goods in the world broken into isolated lockdown cells by COVID-19 or by a future pandemic? That's a very broad area, so to speak. Um, let us begin. Um, Sam, I would love to ask you right away. Um, we all notice our economy is connected globally, um, yet fragmented at the same time for various reasons, like again, COVID, techno technology adoption rates, but also regulations. Where do you see this is heading for companies and what needs to be done to nurture equal opportunities? Yes, um, thank you, and I'm really happy to be here with everybody. Um, I believe undoubtedly we're heading towards a digital world uh, that companies will have to adapt to, a globally connected world that will introduce businesses to cultures and regulatory questions um, that they beforehand never encountered. Mastering the translation you and your company convey across the world has never been more critical, as this may become the way you solely interact I think when we look at nurturing equality, there are many things that we have to consider. Um, but as you said, it's a wide range, so I'll try to focus on two. Um, one is the digital divide. Um, five years ago, it didn't matter if you drove to the interview in a car and I caught the bus. Once we got there, we were on equal ground. Uh, today, you know, we sit in front of 4K cameras, professional lights, top tier Wi-Fi. So as we move rapidly, um, towards a world of hyper digital interaction, we've got to ensure that we can lower costs of both equipment and infrastructure uh, so that equal opportunities are available. Second, I think it's very important is the financial divide. We've got to expedite our regulators on providing the clarity needed to open up the innovation we're seeing right now um, in blockchains. Stellar and, and others where that allow interoperability of payments across the globe. Um, we have Celsius, for instance, that's here. Um, even here in the States, okay, I'm in, I'm in Florida in the States. Um, when you have, let's say, Venmo and PayPal are the same exact company, you can't just move funds between the two. You will have to literally go off of Venmo, catch on to PayPal. Um, we've got to allow small businesses to operate globally and fast, interoperably through payment networks. And I believe that that's the foundation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm curious, Nuke, because uh, Sam already introduced you um, <laughs> that way. So you're basically a crypto bank, uh, which lends cash to its customers. In that regard, you connect the traditional world of finance with the decentralized financial in industries. Where do you see this kind of um, bridge model having the biggest opportunity? Yeah, well... Thank you for having me and uh, thank you, Sam, for the <laughs> pitch. Um, <laughs> look, uh, we, we've been programmed since we were you know, kids and our parents. We've been programmed uh, on how the financial system works and how corporate works. And uh, what we've been told is that, you know, Wall Street kept, kept telling us greed is good and we believed it right? And corporate greed is good. And we believed it. But, you know, and banking, banks can take fees and, and, and fleece our own money for their own gains. And that was good, because we didn't know any better. And in 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto gave us an alternative, right? And uh, all of a sudden, people started asking questions. Is great, really good. Can we do a different way uh, of banking? Can we 
represent our own money in a different way? Can we control it? Can it be more open, democratized? And this is the, the fundamental shift that is going on. And uh, at Celsius, we basically took this ethos and we said, look, you know, there, there is the, the, the new world of new finances, open, democratic, um, you know, decentralized finance and all of that. But there still have to have someone facing the regulators, facing the tax authorities, making, it, making things accessible to people. And this is where we uh, positioned ourselves. And in order to, to do that right, we had to buy the trust of our community. And the only way to buy the trust of the community is to be honest about saying, hey, we work for you. We're not here to fleece you. We're not here to screw you. We're here uh, to uh, work for you. And that was from day one. That's how Celsius positioned uh, its model, its business model. Moving forward, I think you'll see more and more uh, companies having a similar approach. And you already see that. I mean, it, it, even Celsius had impact on some banks that started to reduce their fees or kill fees that are completely unnecessary, basically. It's just just a, another greed element. And and you can see that the, 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 they are threatened by this new model. Uh, moving forward, we are moving into the Web3 world, the world of ownership and control and openness and democracy. And you can see more every day I, I hear uh, 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 entrepreneurs, like the best entrepreneurs that I, I, I met during my last uh, 20 year uh, career, some of them are coming out of retirement. They did a big exit. They come out of retirement. They're so excited about this. You know, they're so excited about this new opportunity. This is new. And Celsius is there. Celsius is there to bridge between people and, and uh, the decentralized finance. And we want to be, I hate calling us a bank. <laughs> we can do banking without banks, but a facilitator, a mediator between this new world forming. And guess what? You know, countries, governments, regulators, and even banks will still exist. Fiat currency will still exist. So somebody needs to be there to represent the people. That that was uh, also my question. Like, do you think still that the um, traditional fiat currency will exist in the, in the yeah. near future? So, yeah. But you answered it already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, we'll have to live side by side. The dollar is not going anywhere. The euro is not going anywhere. At least not in the next fifty years. Or who knows? I, I'm not a, a prophet, but um, it will still be here. The banks, I think, personally, look, this is an opinion. I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I can't predict the future, but I think banks will be diminished. You know, mm -hmm. similar to what you, you mentioned, uh, Alex, our CEO, be, being the, uh, the inventor of voice of IP. What happened to telecom companies? We still have Verizon. We still have AT&T. But they used to own the biggest, tallest buildings in Manhattan. No longer, you know. <laughs> uh, Verizon used to be a very big advocate of killing voice over IP. I, I remember these companies going uh, to the Hill and BC and lobbying against voice over IP. It will kill all the jobs. It, it's super bad for business. Thank goodness they, they didn't succeed. This, this panel is about post-COVID. Imagine COVID without voice over IP. Imagine we, we wouldn't be able to do this, this, this meeting right now. This, Family. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And uh, but now Verizon, just to finish the thought, Verizon is laying cables and and five G antennas. That's the main business model. They're not making money off uh, three dollar a minute phone calls. You know, imagine I would I would have to call a, 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 a Pankaj here, you know, in Dubai. It will cost me a fortune just to spend a few minutes. No longer, right? <laughs> So they found a the new business model in the new wall that they resisted, right? So banks would be kind of like that. That's my thesis here. Mm -hmm. And um, Sam, going back to you in that regard, um, you always uh, and very often talk about the new generation of entrepreneurship. You have a very strong background yourself in that area. Um, and we see the shared economy, the rising creator economy, um, to which extent do you feel 
are those young entrepreneurs positioned uh, to accelerate even the implementation of systems that serve individuals and their communities better? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. I mean, you know, I myself, I, I come from a traditional world and, you know, from real estate and I sold, you know, my entire portfolio to go into this new this new era, right, of, of endless opportunities. And I feel that the younger generation uh, grew up in a, a real unique time in history, the birth of Web 2.0, where at their fingertips, they could easily not only travel the world, but uh, tune in and define their own identity. Um, I think this is why they so quickly grasped the advent of blockchain and tokenization as it truly launched the ability to generate value in nearly every aspect of who they are. I mean, not just real world assets, but you know, poetry, art, uh, community projects. Um, so when you look back over the past 50 years, corporations have been able to capitalize off of this because of their centralization of power, um, you know, kind of like what uh, was mentioned by Verizon, um, and you know, literally able to capitalize off of this um, because because of this. And so they essentially owned what cultures and communities themselves have created. Um, I think when this generation is able to market and not only market, but fund and monetize their their own cool, their own their own ideas to the world directly, we may see the widest spread in global economics and economies our world has ever seen, uh, essentially a new a new main street. It's very exciting that that I must admit, like the beginnings of uh, yeah the empowerment of everyone here on this planet. This would be fantastic. Um, Nuke, last question in that regard. Um, you talked about already trust, um, how you position um, Celsius right from the beginning. We are here to work for you. Um, but still, I have the question, how can we on top build trust and maintain it in addition to the original um, nature of, of, of blockchain technologies? And what challenges do you see we need to overcome in that regard to build trust? Yeah, um, trust is key, right? Uh, when, when you start dealing with the finance and cryptocurrencies and all that, you, you understand that our whole monetary system, our whole econom economy, a human's economy is built on trust. When I give you a piece of paper and you trust that it's a hundred bucks or whatever the piece of paper says on it, it's a belief system. So trust is key. And in order for uh, cryptocurrencies, in order for the blockchain to be a platform of value and value exchange, people need to trust that that value is real. And a lot of it is it's kind of like Web2 network effect, you know, the, 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 the network effect will creates and builds this trust. Human value, what humans value. There's, you know, if, if I hold a piece of gold in some, you know, alien society will say, what is this rock you're holding? I don't care about that, <laughs> right? But we decided it's worth something. NFTs is a good example. But NFTs didn't invent you know, fine art. Fine art always existed. Why is the Mona Lisa worth so much? I don't know. I saw better pictures than the Mona Lisa, but people think it's worth millions and millions of dollars. And also, if I duplicate the Mona Lisa, I can duplicate an exact copy. We have the technology today to create an exact replica of the Mona Lisa, yet it will be worth a few dollars, right? So value is kind of an interesting uh, topic by itself. And then... So we assume value has a, a trust element in it. How do you build it and then maintain it? And I think that that question would be a very tough question if you asked it two or three years ago, right? But I think the use case for cryptocurrencies, the use case for the blockchain is very easy to see right now. All you need to do is turn on the news, right? The world is becoming a, 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 an infomercial for for Bitcoin, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I think all, all we need to do is keep going. And uh, look, right now, right now, only uh, a few percentage of humanity know what we're talking about here. You know, there's there's not enough Bitcoin users yet. There's not enough Ethereum users. The growth is amazing. 
You know, I think Fidelity uh, released the research uh, a few months ago when they showed that the, the, the crypto is actually growing nine times faster. The adoption of crypto is nine times faster than it used the, than the internet. And the internet was like blazing, right? Everybody joined the internet pretty quickly. Uh, so we're doing great, but we have still a long road to go. Uh, you know, the, the message here, this is new. This is freedom. This is democracy. This is ownership. And we need the whole world to be on board. And, uh, and we still have a long, long way to go. But we're doing great. Uh, no, I can't, I can't complain. <laughs> Thank you, Nuke. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so you're based out of Dubai. And um, since you're in real estate, I'm curious to f uh, find out a little bit about your experience in that area because during the pandemic we have seen remote is suddenly almost uh, possible <laughs> and that the purpose of real estate and also the demand for real estate has uh, shifted um, for companies but also people approach um, the need for offices for instance different uh, these days where do you see the mobilization of workforce is heading and How can companies adapt to it strategically? Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, very, very interesting question. And I think uh, the place where I live, uh, Dubai and, or UAE, I have been in UAE for 24 years. And I think uh, the last, the growth which I have seen in all these 24 years, it is certainly pre-pandemic, during pandemic, and post-pandemic, if I were to say that we are in a post-pandemic scenario. And I think I can give you, or, or I can think of multiple situations, right? Which gives me, or for that matter, our investor base or our ecosystem, which GII operates in, a very comprehensive picture. You know, and you know, the topic is very interesting, the strategies in digital pandemized age, right? And I would like to give some examples just before uh, pandemic, right? And Or when I just before, like before pandemic, and what I have seen in pandemic, mm -hmm. and how companies have worked, they uh, sort of uh, formulated their strategies during pandemic, and also now sort of coming up with hybrid or or coming up with those kind of strategies which can also cater to the business, assuming something like this happen again. You know, a very very interesting company I can think of which I was part of is 2009-10, I came across a company out of US called Biomegene, right? Now, you and I, we all have seen pathology as something non-digital. So, you know, I go for my test, they give me report, so on and so forth. I'm talking about 2008-2009. And whereas x-rays, you know, other things have got digital, but pathology not. Biomagine was probably one of the first companies which converted pathology into digital form. So while they are analyzing your, let's say somebody has been tested for, basically for cancer. So though that information can be transferred to actually, let's say Cleveland or John Hopkins in real time from some part of the world where the info, it was very difficult to have expertise or a skill set to analyze or to do the work, uh, you know, uh, research work on uh, on that sample. So this is where I say that the world has always been moving fast. We all know that uh, what kind of achievement people have done. And the fact that if we look at top 10 companies of the world or of the US market, the seven are technology related. And digital is a very, very strong part. My able, you know, able friends, Sam and uh, You both talk about how decentralized finance or open banking is changing the world. And to be very honest, I see it day in, day out. Uh, uh, Abu Dhabi Global Market has started crypto exchanges. You know, I, you know, as Nuke was saying, I'm, I'm one of those people who are actually uh, no, no off crypto or blockchain business, bit involved, but still a lot to learn, but very, very I think we, I, I come from that uh, genre which believe that it has good potential. You know, it would be future. So I, I come from that, that particular category. Coming back, so 
I, we have seen that what has happened in before pandemic digitalization. I can also talk of very interesting company uh, in this part of the world, uh, which we were as Gulf Islamic Investment. We were part of it. It's a very important company to quote. quote it is called Mums World. It's the largest e-commerce for catering to mother and child segment or mother and baby segment. They are bigger and better than Amazon in that segment in this region. So you can understand that how good these guys are. And we got in this company sometime in 2017, I think, 17, 18. And I was on the board of the company. Of course, uh, in pandemic, it got a different kind of impetus. And we made a very decent exit. We made money. But we saw how this, uh, you know, the e-commerce business made life easy of so many working parents. The things are delivered. And again, it includes not only e-commerce, I'm talking about delivery, I'm talking about prop tech, I'm talking about everything from digitalization perspective. So these things made life very, very easy. Now, a very clear trend I see that any company or any com or the companies which we evaluate for investment perspective, and they have some kind of consumer facing business, they are very clear that there should be a uh, the the, the 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 company should have a business model where irrespective of this kind of a situation or unprecedented situation companies should be able to cater to the demands of their consumers so that has become a sort of a by default uh i would say feature when the business plan is being drawn i mean we uh, i will i get a, i get a chance to evaluate companies practically every day and most of the time, the pitch starts with the fact, no, no, this, this, that our company can handle this, this, this during pandemic. Coming back to a question on digital, uh, on prop tech or real estate. Here, you know, uh, this place is a big mix of East and West, and they see a lot of people are dependent on domestic help, gardeners, property management company, and these. During COVID, we realized a lot of these service providers are living, they live in shared accommodation. When they live in shared accommodation during pandemic, it was a very difficult situation. So what, how they managed it, first of all, most of the good of the day, we have <clears throat> wonderful infrastructure. So immediately the property management company worked with the apartment blocks and got their people live within the apartment, uh, in the block. So there were flows created for, uh, flows sort of made available for them. And then there's a company I can tell you, very, very interesting company called Home Genie. It is on app, it is on uh, on website also. This company was created. You can get, they are solving two problems. One, you can get your the problem sorted out. Second, it was a marketplace for plumbers, uh, electricians, AC guys, that who they were like sort of out of job because of pandemic situation. They can get themselves registered and I need a sort of, I have a problem with my AC. These guys would be, this Home Genie is a uh, is like an exchange. You know, they would take care of everything and they would give you a, a person or a team, right, uh, which cater to your requirement. So this is something which we, you know, I, I was here and uh, to be very honest, Dubai or UAE, we saw only three months, which was March 2020, April 2020 and May 2020, a part of June 2020. These three months, or I would say maximum 100 days, we had a bit of a school close of this. And I'm a lot of people get a shock that uh, the, uh, that the schools were not closed or the schools were open from September 20 onwards and they were never closed. So my kids were going to school. So, you know, we had a very, very normal time. So coming back, I think uh, it, a lot of depends on the leadership vision and what kind of entrepreneurship is available in the region. So we saw how uh, real estate companies were able to provide solution. Second, on office side, the demand of office, the nature of real estate, yes, big change, I would say. People are looking for a spacious residences. Office space have been affected. But I'm of the view, because we do a lot of commercial real estate, the impact has not been 40, 50%. I would say incremental maximum, maximum 10%. You know, if it was like people who were working 80% from offices or 85 from offices and 15 from home, that number is now 75, uh, 25 at best. 
here the demand of offices has gone up again and like in most other parts of the world because we have uh, assets in east coast us uk paris just to give you and i would like to close my uh, answer with this thing we acquired and this was a it's a unbelievable thing we acquired 400000 square feet of commercial real estate in peak of the uh, pandemic in paris east paris okay montfort and we with a vacancy of 1.5% <laughs> you know so wow. that defies the <laughs> you know and <clears throat> i and not only this uh, and the seller is a global uh, company from us oak tree capital and they were saying guys we are not very sure whether you would be able to close the deal is 250 million euro you know commercial real estate we said no we believe in it and i'm trying by highlighting this this particular uh, asset that commercial real estate and especially um, you know nadeen in your part of the world europe which people were sort of saying oh no i don't think people will going back to offices this is this asset we acquired in march 21 and there has been an unbelievable demand for these kind of assets yes there is an impact but at the same time it is from location to location prime location like manhattan you would see mm-hmm. demand going down but you to west virginia you know i'm telling you there is a place called richmond you know <laughs> there is a big big demand you know, the big are is still the same you know they they have not gone to 20-25% occupancy stay at 80-90%. You know, I know a place uh, in Florida, Jacksonville. We acquired an asset in June 21. You won't believe the kind of uh, returns we are making on it, and there's so much of demand. So I would say yes, there's an impact. Mm-hmm. And with this, I would like. So I think I've taken enough time. But it is from pocket to pocket. Okay, yeah. but residential certainly the demand has gone off the roof. Yeah, and 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 Nuke. Um... I would love to hear your experience and also opinion about this from the financial um, perspective. What do you feel um, companies should take into consideration when they want to secure their future competitiveness? Yeah, uh, I, th- I think it's ge- it goes a little beyond financial. It's it's more mm-hmm. of a concept of um, Web three. And um, let me just say that first. In 2000, Paul Krugman. Uh, Nobel Prize laureate, right? He said famously that the fax machine will win over the internet. Okay, in 2007, Steve Ballmer from Microsoft ridiculed to the iPhone. Said nobody will pay 400 bucks for for a phone. People, even the smartest of us, don't grasp uh, major fundamental changes that technology brings sometimes. I can tell you that web free, crypto, blockchain, decentralization, ownership is bigger than any of those. This is one of the biggest, most fundamental shifts the technology ever brought to humanity. And we're still just, just seeing the tip of the iceberg here. And it's a very, very fundamental shift that corporates, institutions, governments, will have to uh, adapt to and uh, i'm not sure how long it will take i'm not sure how it will be done but i'm pretty sure they'll have to to deal with it um i'll give you an example you know uh Pankai said uh, talked about real estate you know why can't a deed be a digital version that i carry with me i don't need to rely on some government agency or local agency to to have a library of uh, paper deeds that, you know, um, I can talk about uh, uh, your personal uh, information. So companies like Google and Facebook uh, did great monetizing on our data. How about a, a, a world when I control my data? I give you permission before you use the data. You don't just take it and, and use it. And more and more company will have to adapt to that now it's not it won't work everywhere but i think we we have not yet uh, seen the full potential of this this shift and it's major and major A- again i'm saying you know the, the biggest best brains and entrepreneurs are, are, are just now starting to find their voice their the rhythm with web3 
And I think within the next year or two, you'll see much clearer view on where, uh, uh, where it's going and how institutions, corporates, governments, all these, uh, these guys will, uh, uh, will need to adapt. So interesting times for sure. Um, Sam, I'm curious, because you're advising companies and institutions on tokenomics, I always feel it's a tongue twister. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I feel like you can also um, experience and observe some blind spots that probably both industries have, like uh, or worlds, so to speak, like the traditional world, but also the decentralized uh, world. What are those yeah. blind spots in, 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 in your experience and opinion and what can be done about them? Well, yeah, there's, a, there, there's quite a bit, but I um, kind of once again, I guess I can try to hopefully focus on a few. Um, I think that when we're looking at the old fashioned world, I think that their blind spot is, is pretty straightforward. They're years behind in a, a world that is changing by the minute, right? Uh, a day in, in crypto and in blockchain is is like a week or two weeks in the traditional field. So, um, for instance, our, our CEO, Narup, she co-wrote one of the first papers on tokenomics. That was way back, I think, in, in 2018, which focused on the, how value was created in tokenized assets. And so when we work with companies to help navigate the ever-evolving landscape, um, I think we first try to identify their objectives and target use case. So that we, way we can ensure, for instance, um, that, you know, we find the correct protocol that best supports it. There's a wide range of options and each with their own unique communities. And this plays a large role in the success or failure project. So, you know, I think that there's definitely an importance of community um, that many established uh, institutions don't quite understand off the back that's involved. Um, and, you know, as behind all these nodes that make up the decentralized networks are, are people. Um, uh, another factor I'll add to uh, with traditional markets is their risk mitigation. Um, an example is, uh, when the world life world, uh, wildlife fund, uh, they wanted to create an, uh, eco-friendly NFT project to raise funds. Um, but they chose a blockchain that, uh, while they thought used low energy consumption and was earth friendly, actually was a layer that leveraged upon a proof of work system that meant that literally every transaction was an estimation of about 2,100 times higher energy uses than uh, they originally uh, thought was in existence. And uh, it ended up being a huge PR crisis. So I think with, with when you look at the traditional traditional companies and corporations, um, you know, they, they you know, as, as was mentioned earlier, it's, uh, it's something that they're very smart, they're very advanced, but they didn't really grasp. Um, and so when coming into blockchain they, or decentralization, you just can't pick up anything and go with it. You really have to have um, an in-depth understanding and realization that um, whether it's real estate, whether it's, you know, high speed transactions or Forex, there's different use cases and different maneuvers that you have to consider. Um, I, I think when we deal with more crypto or decentralized blockchain based uh, companies, I think the um, uh, probably the simplest thing that they fail to accept is the reality that uh, when compared when you compare the the digital size to the the rest of the world, it's still very very small, right? Uh, the entire market cap of cryptos, for instance, is less than the size of Apple. <laughs> I think today we're at 1.8 trillion. Apple's market cap is around 2.67 trillion. So um, there's still a, a ways to go, um, which means that there's not only the importance of working with the establishment, not just with corporations and, and making sure we integrate with them, but also with the regulation, working with governments. Um, I think it's still very important. And, and many times I think within that field, you know, we're, you know, culturally in the decentralized crypto world, we're, we're innovators. We want to kind of spread out. So I think that that's important. But also, too, I think when you look at where we are and as exciting and as and as innovative as it is, there's still so much to go. I think that a lot of attention has to be to the end user, right? There's, you know, crypto has been around for for a long time now, right? For over a decade. But um, there's still a lack of 
of of confusion and hesitation from the general public. So I think a need and a focus on, you know, creating seamless user experiences and also creating confidence in the largely untapped population that exists is very important. Thank you, Sam, for your opinion on that. Um, since we're approaching almost the end of the session, um, I would love, love to um, ask Pankai. Um, <laughs> you experience both ends of the world, like the Asian, Southeast Asian region. Also, you do investments there. And I would be curious to find out, do you feel that companies small or much more advanced in those regions might be even better equipped to adopt uh, technologies and to kind of really set for their um, future competitiveness than, let's say, the American companies? Okay. Um, you know, very interesting question. And I think I can talk about, again, from my experiences, not only company level, I think I'll give you two examples. But these are companies which are working with very limited resources. And when I'm talking of limited resources, I'm talking with few thousands of dollars a month. Okay, with these kind of sources, but these are addressing, these are more like NGOs addressing the education need of slums schools, right? So one of the companies which I'm, and I got a chance to work with both of these companies, so I can give you first-hand information. So there's a company, uh, there's a setup called Abhyan Bharat, ABF, Abhyan Bharat Foundation or Mission India Foundation. So it is based out of Jaipur, the beautiful city out of India, and they work with slum schools and now during covid these slum schools have a massive problem first these guys first they're underprivileged they were out of the parents were not getting work and kids cannot go to school B because of technology and because of you know that fast digitalization small companies used mobile used devices for them use tablet phone companies and one of the companies I'm associated is called Yantra. These companies were able to provide these tools to these schools. Of course, there were other companies or individuals who were sponsoring them. But these small companies, part of a very fragile economy, economic side of it, were able to carry education during COVID time. And you would not believe, I'll give you a stat, in Abhyan Bharat, Bharat Foundation, ABF schools, the attendance was more than 55% only. Okay. This is the power of technology. This is the power of initiative. This is the power of nimbleness. You know, what we call in, in, in Asia, or let's say I got called talk of India, there is a word called Jugar. It's a Hindi word, which means get it done somehow. So, you know, it's a very, there's a book written on this, uh, this word that with even you know you have to mix and uh, match but you get it done so those are the things another company katha you would not believe students which are working part time in bakery in ac repairs they have been work, uh, been i have been part of that group to teach them entrepreneurship over weekends and they are setting up their own small businesses by learning on these kind of zoom calls this so this is building that ecosystem getting part of an ecosystem which the in the foundation is on digital digital resources and able to be self-reliant so all the, the hundreds of examples small economy the small companies in asia they got self-reliant and i think because they were uh, less of bureaucratic thing and the whole objective is to get some solution I think, and I, you know, I can give you actual example of a very interesting company out of US called Control Find. We have only one one minute left. <laughs> Control Find, very small business. They closed their two galleries in US because of pandemic, but mm -hmm. they were able to create a marketplace online. So small companies, I think, when it comes to a question of survival of uh, the survival, that you know the need of survival, they would figure out a solution. And today, technology provides multiple ways to exist. So that's <laughs> my, and I'm very happy about it. That was very, very, very exciting, very insightful, um, and also inspirational of, of, uh, of all of you. And I hope that everyone who joined us throughout 
has, has the same experience. And thank you so much for taking time, for sharing thank your you. opinions. It was a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.